guys come on in and let's uh, let's do church. Welcome this morning. We're so glad that you're here today, that you have made South Haven your place of worship today. Uh, on this Easter Sunday, let's make sure we understand exactly what God is doing and what He has done and uh, the life that He has given us. So I would say to you, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. That's right. I'm Pastor Richard, a senior pastor here, and we're just thankful that, again, that you have chosen South Haven as your place of worship. We welcome those of you that are streaming online. We are thankful that you have found us on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page and also our website, so thank you for tuning in as well. A few things happening here at South Haven here uh, you want to be aware of. One of those things is regarding our membership process that happens to Discover South Haven. Our next class is April the 21st, and that will happen right after the 1030 service. In our hospitality room, we provide you lunch. We'll take care of your children. We'll have you out of here by 1.15. So that is our membership process. Please let us know if you're interested. The Connect card that's in your bulletin is a great way to get that information back to us regarding anything, that, any sign-ups or anything that you're needing, uh, uh, needing some questions about or prayer requests. That Connect card is in your bulletin. I would say that for you as our guest today as well. We'd love to connect with you. We just want to say thank you for being here today. On, in the Connect card that's in your bulletin, if you would just give us a little information. Here, we do exchange these Connect cards for really good things like chocolate chip cookies. And so we've got those for you right out there. You don't want to miss that. Completed Connect card gets you a cookie. So come on out and uh, say hello at the end of the service and introduce yourself regarding that. A couple of other things. Uh, there's a summer camp that will be taking place this summer. That is an all-summer camp. If you're uh, as a parent or a grandparent and just needing a safe, uh, really strong, uh, faith-based place for your kids to be this summer, that we are providing that. Uh, there's more information. Read about that in the bulletin, and there's a website there you can go to that gives you more information as well. And so uh, but let us know that you might have some interest in that. Other things that are going on here at South Haven, you can see in your bulletin, such as a parent-child or a baby dedication that's coming up later in April. There's a woman's event that's coming up you might be interested in, a mission trip, Bible studies, all that. Read that in there and uh, see if that's something that you may need to connect with as well. You know, one of the most wonderful things that we get to do at South Haven is to celebrate new life in Christ. And so here in a moment, these waters, these baptismal waters are about to be stirred, and we're about to uh, see. Here's what has happened, is that individuals have individually given their life to Christ, and they are following up that decision in baptism today, letting you know that Jesus is Lord. Watch this. Here we go, Victor. Yep. service and with 10 baptisms today, and we are blessed to uh, walk through these waters as Pastor said to stir these waters. And you know, Paul says, uh, if Christ be not risen, our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. But aren't you glad that he is risen? He is risen indeed today. Amen? Woo! <laughs> and to uh, demonstrate how Christ is in the miracle business of taking something dead and he makes it alive again. What a better picture of that than the baptismal waters. And this is Kyle Barkey. And Kyle, what is your public profession say today in front of all these people? Jesus is Lord. Amen, brother. Find that public demonstration of faith, my brother. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very impressive. Yeah. And we're in the water in the name of the Lord. Woo! Kyle and Mrs. Brielle, one of the neat things about Kyle and Brielle is that they came into my office about three weeks ago, both of them, and sat down, got to hear, uh, just walk through the scriptures of what, what is salvation, and both of them at that time said, we need Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So, Brielle, Mrs. Brielle, what is your public profession of faith in front of all these people? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Stand up, just one more step right there. We all upon that public profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very Christ is there. I'm ready to walk in the name of the Father. Woo! Right there. All right. We got some little ones coming in. All right. All right. This is Deacon Jacob. And uh, Deacon, Deacon's just saying if they want to go, how did that? With his mom and dad here, they got your fan club here. That's awesome to see. And so he uh, accepted Christ just recently. Uh, Dr. Tabitha, and they've been talking at home with mom and dad. 
And so, Deacon, what does your public profession of faith? Jesus is Lord. Amen, Deacon. Find that public profession of faith. I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very conscious of that. And I'm ready to walk in the name of the wife. Woo! Okay, this is Everly Jacobs, and Everly accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior just a few weeks ago, and so Everly, what is your public profession of faith? Jesus is Lord. Amen. <laughs> Everly, upon that public profession of faith, I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very impressive, yeah. And ready to walk in the name of the wife. Woo! <laughs> Well, that lost in there. Come on in, boys. <laughs> All right. This is Joseph. Joseph Maples. Come on, Jim. Stand right there. Oh, here you go. I can't hold you the whole time. All right, Joseph, except for Jesus Christ, he's got his mom and dad up here, and then I think they're out there somewhere. Else. All right. Joseph, what is your public? What's your public confession of faith in front of all these people, brother? Jesus Amen. Amen. Joseph, upon that public profession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very precious. Very precious. Very precious. Woo! <laughs> we got a swimmer. All right. Let's see. Oh, let's see who's back. <laughs> Lucy came into my office, and uh, man, I tell you what, the Lord was just working in her life, and Lucy knew that she needed a Savior, and she uh, was under conviction of the Holy Spirit, and right there in the office, Lucy accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. So, Lucy, what is your public profession of faith in front of all these people? Jesus is Lord. All right, Lucy, upon that public profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very Christ is there. Raise your voice and raise your voice. All right. Woo! All right. <laughs> Calm down. Isn't this fun? I love this. All right. So this is Raven Martinez, and Raven also accepted Jesus Christ just, just a few days ago, really. And so, uh, Excited to see how the God is working in her life and her children's life. And so, um, Raven, what is your public profession of faith? All these people. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Raven, upon that public profession of faith, I baptize you in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very Christ is Lord. And raise the life of the man of the life. Woo! And Raven was, of course, concerned about her children, and so this is Sydney, and Sydney came in with her mama, and they walked through the scriptures uh, with, with her and Kelly Joe, and accepted Jesus just last Friday, on Good Friday. And what a beautiful day to be saved on Good Friday. And here we are on Easter Sunday, and we are going to experience new life with you. So what is your public profession of faith today? Jesus is Lord. All right. Sydney, upon that public profession of faith, I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very precious, yes. And ready for all the name of the Christ. Woo! All right, let's go. My brother Carlito right here, big man on campus right here. He accepted Christ in the office this last week. And so, Carlito, what's your public profession of faith? Jesus Amen, brother. By that public profession of faith, I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Ready? Ready to cry and ready to walk the man is alive. We got one more somewhere. Come on, brother. All right. This is Tim McQueen coming in. Tim was just telling me last week that you know he was he was baptized at a younger time, but he didn't understand and wanted to. Nail this down. He didn't really realize the importance or what was going on. Feels like he's wandered some, but he wants to nail.
fell down in his salvation, make sure he's walking the Lord. So today he's on the walk of obedience through the, the baptismal waters. So Tim, what is your public profession of faith? Jesus. Lord, amen, brother. Remember the time from our public profession of faith, I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear to Christ for the gift. Praise the Lord for the gift life. Woo! Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful to be in your service today, Father, to watch you at work in people's lives. And Father, we have just demonstrated the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are burdened, Father, for losses in this world. And Lord, there are so many more. We have an unfinished task to teach, to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. So, Father, today, if there are those in this service who have never heard, who have never been walked through the scriptures, Lord, who've never called out upon the name of Jesus, would today be the day of salvation, Father. They would leave this place changed as these ten could have been changed with their lives. Father, may this be a day that is glorifying to you. May we, in our worship today, worship you with our mouths, our singing, our preaching, all of what we have within us, Father. May you be glorified in this Easter Sunday today. We love you. We cherish you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the power of the resurrection. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What an incredible way to begin our service. You've just seen the picture of what we are celebrating here today. When they go into the water, it, rep- it symbolizes Jesus going into the grave. And when they come up as a new creation in Christ, they are showing what Jesus did three days later. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's stand together. Let's worship the risen Savior. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond. All creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved. For the reason why it's overcome And for every need There's an empty grave For the reason why it's overcome Now the silence breaks In the name of Jesus the heavens cry and the earth respond. All creation shouts with a voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives way for the reason why it's overcome. For every fear, it's an empty grave. For the reason why it's overcome. Let's sing with all your voice. He shall reign forever. Sing it, church. He shall reign forever. Strongholds now surrender for the Lord. Our God has overcome. Who can be against us? Jesus, our defender, He is Lord, and He has overcome. He shall reign forever. Strongholds now. Surrender for the Lord, our God has overcome. Who can be against us? Jesus, our defender, He is Lord, and He has overcome. We will not be moved when the earth gives way. For the reason why it's all 
expectation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. No better place. So thankful that you're here this morning again. And just, wow, what a, what a great experience we've already had. We've been working through some questions that Jesus asked here at South Haven these last few weeks. There's about 150 questions Jesus asked just in the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we've been pulling a few of those out and saying those questions that Jesus was asking then are some questions that are still relevant for you and me today. And so it only makes sense we continue that today because actually there's a question, a little forward question that Jesus is asking and actually, it's around a situation, it's around a resurrection, but it's not Jesus' resurrection, but it sure sets it up and lets us know the power of our Lord. And as he asks Martha the question, do you believe this? We're about to discover what that this is here in just a moment as we investigate this wonderful question wrapped around this whole word of believe, do you believe this? You know, have you ever been uh, talking, having a conversation, or maybe someone has said something to you or you've asked, you know, it, you know and, you, and it starts out something like this. You're not going to believe this. I, you're, I'm not, you know, I'm about to tell you something, and you're not really going to believe it, but it, it's the truth. I'm about to tell you something. And actually, what comes next, you say, you know what, you're not going to believe this, but you're telling them something unusual, something unordinary, uh, something that's not ordinary, and something that's just kind of like, wow, that kind of boggles my mind. You know, we find that a lot of times. We say that phrase. There's a few things in life that we just can't believe. You know what I have a hard time believing is that God has created us, and in, in an adult individual has enough blood vessels, get this, that if you were to take them and put them end to end in the human body, all of our blood vessels, they will go around the globe four times. That's kind of hard to believe. You know how many miles? That's 100,000 miles of blood vessels. Wow, that's kind of hard to believe. It's kind of hard to believe that in 1997, when NASA began to explore Mars, that three men sued NASA for trespassing. There you go. And yeah, it's hard to believe, right? Yeah. You know what? They, they claimed that they, were, they inherited Mars 3,000 years ago from their ancestors. There you go. That's kind of hard to believe. That's a real thing. Here, I, have, I find this hard to believe, is that if you have a fear of very long words. I don't know if that's you. Sometimes we just like, oh, I just don't want to say that. If you have a fear of very long words, there's a name for that. Here. Go figure. Someone someone really had fun with that, did they? So that is what you are if you have a fear of very long words. So you just try to figure that one out. And I have to count them. There's 36 letters in that word. And so listen, we just say like, wow, that's kind of hard to believe. You know, there's just some things that's hard to believe. And we find that even in Scripture. There's just things. You know what? It's around this time. A lot of times throughout maybe Christian seasons, whether it's Christmas or whether it's Easter or certain things, you might see the, uh, the news post or something come through or you might read it in a magazine or something. There's always someone trying to disprove some miraculous things in Scripture. And so we just like, why? Because it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, you won't believe this. It just doesn't make sense. And it's in the Bible, but still, there's got to be a very scientific, very practical understanding of that. There was a young boy that was in his Sunday school class said that he was having a hard time believing one of the stories. And he, he uh, actually, he came out of the Sunday school class and his dad asked him, said, son, what did you learn about uh, in Sunday school today? And he said, well, we learned about Moses taking the children of Israel, leading them out of Egypt and into uh, up to the Red Sea. And dad said, well, that's a great story. Tell me what you learned. And he goes, well, dad, he goes, if Moses led them out of Egypt and they come to the Red Sea, he said, all of a sudden, you know, Pharaoh's army was really upset that they were, that they were leaving. And so Pharaoh's army starts coming after them. And dad said, yeah, that, that's good. And he goes, and then dad, he said, this is, this is what happened next. He said, and then as the Pharaoh's army's coming in, Moses gets on a walkie-talkie and he calls in the Israeli Air Force to do an airstrike on the Egyptian army. And he said, and while they're doing that, he goes, he gets the Israeli uh, Navy to build a pontoon bridge, and they build one over the Red Sea. All the children of Israel cross over, and they were all saved. Dad said, really? He goes, is this really how they told it to you in Sunday school? Well, Dad, not exactly. 
He said, but if I told it to you like they told it to me, you would never believe it. <laughs> we have a hard time grasping that, don't we? Some stories, in, that is included in the resurrection. Sometimes we just have a hard time believing that there was an individual who died and came back to life. And you know what? Even today, there might be some that have a hard time believing it today. They have a hard, hard time believing it when it really happened, you know? You know that when the women were the first ones at Jesus' empty tomb, and when they found it and actually had a conversation with angels, and then they go back and begin to tell the disciples, do you realize that the disciples were like, hey, what you're saying, we don't believe what you're saying. Here, here's what Luke says in uh, Luke 24. He said, but these words that the women were telling seemed like nonsense to them. You know, you guys are, it's like, what is this, like dolphin speak or something? What are you saying? You know, they did not believe the women. There was one of Jesus' disciples. After Jesus appeared to the disciples in a closed room, and they finally were like, hey, okay, we believe this. One was absent. His name was Thomas. Thomas, they, they all tell Thomas, hey, we just saw Jesus, and he's alive, he's alive. And he goes, I don't believe it. I don't see it unless I touch him, unless I see him, unless I put my hands in the nail prints. I'm not going to believe it. Even at the time of Jesus' resurrection, those who were there and heard him talk about it had a hard time believing it. And it wasn't because Jesus never told anybody. Mark chapter 8, Jesus is telling them. He began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, to be killed and then rise after three days. So Jesus is telling them. This is happening. He told them repeatedly what was going to happen. But then we land at this moment Yes, he's been telling it, and then he has this lengthy conversation with this woman named Martha. And his conversation with Martha happened around the death of Martha's brother. His name is Lazarus. So Lazarus has died, and by the time Jesus arrives at this good friend of his, Lazarus, by the time he arrives at his grave, Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. So this is really, really like, uh, Jesus, you're too late. That's what they were saying. You know, if you would have been here, that's what they were saying, my... My, my brother would have been alive. So Martha's brother, Lazarus, was in the grave. Jesus shows up. And Martha and Jesus begin to have a conversation. And in the book of John, chapter 11, beginning of verse 23, it kind of goes like this as Jesus shows up and talks to Martha. And he says, Your brother will rise again, Jesus said. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said, here, here's an incredible statement. I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Oh, what a great question. So this is the question right back to Martha. Do you believe this? Do you believe exactly what I have just shared with you? Do you believe this? What a great question. One of those questions that Jesus asked. We've been talking about those. Again, I've already shared that with you. We've been talking about that here. Just as an aside, if, if you are just kind of grappling with some worry these days, one of those questions Jesus asked was about people's worry. You can find that on the church's website. You might want to check that out. But the question today that was directed at Martha is also directed to you and me. It's a great question for us on Easter Sunday. Do you believe this? What is the this? Well, it's everything that Jesus had just said about himself. It's everything that he had just said. He said, do you believe this? And that question needs to be in our hearts and minds this morning. Do you believe this? Again, back at John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, and this is what we're, he's asking to believe, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, this is hard to believe. Even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Our question, do you believe this? Martha affirmed that she did in verse 27. Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. Do you believe this? There's two great truths I just want to express to us this morning in the time that we have left two really great truths about Jesus. And I'm just going to challenge you today. Do you believe these truths? There's two great truths. They're very wonderful truths. And I think all of us would want these. We just say, do I believe these truths? Here's the first truth. 
Jesus alone has the power to give life. That's the truth. Okay, there's the truth. Jesus alone has the power to give life. So let's talk about this. How, how does Jesus have the, the power to do that? Well, let's find out. Because actually, we, He is God Himself. Okay, so He has always been and always will be. And, and Jesus even is attesting to His deity in this scripture right here. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you realize that was a very controversial statement that Jesus made at this time? He is so controversial. Why? Because Jesus is making a proclamation about being God. Where is that? When he says, I am. Jesus says, I am. Where does that take us back? He has said several I am. John records seven different times where John, Jesus said, I am. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the, the bread of life. I am the gate. I am the vine. And he says here, I am the resurrection and the life. But listen, this goes all the way back to the Old Testament. This is an Old Testament thing. When Moses is at the burning bush, and God is speaking to Moses, and he's telling him, it's time, I want you to go and get my people out of Egypt and deliver them. And Moses has all these excuses, and the one that he says is this. If I'm going to go do this, who do I say is the one that is telling me to tell them? Who is the one? Who, who, how, how do I identify this person? And the Lord just simply says, you tell them, I am has sent you. So now back to Jesus. This is God saying, I am. And Jesus is saying, I am. And when Jesus even told individuals, actually in the book of John chapter 8, before Abraham, he says, I am was I am. He goes, I existed before him. You know what they did? The scripture says they picked up rocks and they were about to stone him to death. They were so offended at what Jesus was saying. They said, this is not who you're claiming to be God. And so, yes, this is what we find here. And what does that have to do with us? Jesus alone has the power to give life. He is telling us he is Lord. He is God. He has the power within him to give us life. Here in a minute, we're going to talk about he has the power to defeat death. This is who he is. In John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus says, I have come to give you life, and I give you life in an abundance. You know, that abundance there is not like uh, material wealth, a fat bank account, a nice car, or the, the abundance he's talking about here is far in exceeding all of that. And when Jesus comes and says, I've come to give you life, and it's life to the fullest and life that you like you've never had. It is a life that is far beyond this world. It's interesting. Because we can talk about the word life, and we're all saying right here, I am evidence that there is life. My heart is beating. I am breathing. I am here. This is not the life that Jesus is talking about. Do you realize that in the New Testament, there are several different words that are used for life? And the life that Jesus is talking about here when he says, I've come to give you life, it's not our physical life. There is a word for that in the scriptures, and it is the word bios. You get that? B-I-O-S. And so what you immediately think, well, that sounds kind of like biology. It's exactly right. That's where we get our word. If you're in school, you study biology. It is a Greek word from the word bios, which means the study of human life or the study of life. This is not the word Jesus is using here. Jesus is not saying, I've come to give you bios life. He's coming. He's, actually, the word is zoe. He said, I'm coming to give you Zoe life. That's a different life. Oh, what does that life mean? Eternal, spiritual, never-ending, life in abundance. That is the life he's come to give. And so when Jesus is the only one that has the power to do so, this type of life then means for us that we, yes, have been born, we were given bios life. But here's the, here's the language from Scripture, from the Bible. When you're born again, it's a second birth. It's spiritual birth. That's where we get Zoe life. Now, that sure begs the question, and I would want to know, how in the world do I get that? How can I get that Zoe life? What does that mean? Because that sounds rather intriguing. I've got one. You mean there's another kind of life? Absolutely. And it comes back to this one word that Jesus was emphasizing with Martha, and it's the word believe. Do you get the word belief? Here it is. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, even if he dies, that's the physical death, will live. I don't know about you, that's pretty good news for me. That really resonates with me. The one who dies, even if he dies, he will live. You know that word believe? That was a popular word with John, the author of this gospel. It appears about 100 times 
in this book. John is acting as if he's trying to get some point across. Here's one of those key verses reveals this truth. John chapter 20, verse 31. John writes, the these are written. The these is he's, I have chronicled the life of Christ and wrote it down in the book of John. It's written, why? So that you may believe. He says, this is the whole reason I wrote this down, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have Zoe, you may have life in His name. That's the reason He wrote it. So then to believe, that's a simple thing. Believe is to trust, is to receive, is to accept Christ as your Savior and your Lord. That's why He came. And you know, I find it interesting as a story about a, uh, a missionary. His name was John Patton. Now, John Patton was a missionary many years ago. And he was a missionary to a place in the Pacific called the New Herbides Islands. And he was actually trying to translate the book of John into the language of these natives on this island. And actually, they were not a nice people. They were cannibals. And he is ministering in the midst of these people. And he is trying to figure out how to, here, how to translate the word believe in their language. Now, that's got to be a big deal in the book Gospel of John because that word occurs about a hundred times. And so he's, uh, he's sitting at his desk one day and he's working on this translation and he's trying to come up with the word believe and what does it mean in this language and how do I communicate that? And then one of his assistants who is from that island walks in, sits down and they begin talking and John Patton looks at this man and says, what am I doing? He said, well, you're sitting down. Then he goes this, he does this. He goes, okay, now what am I doing? And the man looked at him for a minute, and he said, Well, you're putting your whole weight upon that chair. And all of a sudden, it just dawned on him, This is my word. He gave him one word that meant that. And he all of a sudden, he wrote it down. He goes, This is what it means. To believe, then would be for you and me to put our whole weight, everything that we have, upon Jesus. And trusting Him and believing Him that He has come for a purpose. We have to understand that there is a problem in the world, and Jesus is the answer to the problem. You know, the biggest problem in the world is a sin problem, and Jesus has come to answer the problem. And He is the answer to the sin problem that all resides within each one of us. And when we put our whole weight on Him, trusting Him, believing in Him, knowing that He is my Savior, He is the Lord, and that if I trust Him, just like ten individuals did just a few minutes ago, and at some point over the last few weeks, they have given their life to Christ. They believe. They put their whole weight on Jesus. And they're saying, you are my Savior. You're my Lord. This is what we're finding here. And this is the aspect of life that Jesus has come to give. Lean your whole weight on Him. Jesus has the resurrection and the life. He is the only God, entity, person, individual that has the power to do that. No one else has the power to do that. There's one other thing. I find very encouraging is that this, Jesus alone has the power to defeat death. This is what we find here. Jesus has the resurrection and the life. He not only gives life, eternal life, but then He has the power to defeat death. He did that. Listen, He goes back and He says this, even if He dies, even if someone dies, He will live, she will live because of the life of Christ which is in them. Here's this statistic that you, I think, will, is, is this it's just always, it's always true. Here it is. One out of one of every person, people, will die. One out of one. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a tried and true statistic, and it always comes to pass. It's an inevitability that death will come at one point in our life. Earlier this month, my wife Amy made this post on Facebook. Yep. That's, that's me and my bride, my bride and I, 35 years ago, and that was our night of engagement. That's when we got engaged. It's like March 5th, right, Amy? Is it March 5th? Yeah, something around right there. Okay, I've got it. I shouldn't even ask. I was doing good until I asked. It's the engagement. It's not the anniversary. I, I got it. Okay. But anyway, you know, as I was looking at that, I thought, like, my goodness, I was young. I was 24 years old, and... My goodness, and so much life and everything. And then, right after that, I, I just, you know, you, I looked in the mirror. And I was like, wow, 
little bit more gray, a few more wrinkles. I got some things going on here. And you know what? Here, I came to the conclusion. It wasn't, it wasn't hard to do either. I'm getting old. My body's decaying. It's giving out. And someday, this shell and this person will no longer be there. And I go to something such as what Jesus is saying here and reminding us. God, it's not about plastic surgery and it's not anything about age-defying creams and supplements and those things that we try to hang on and we try to be healthy and that's fine. But we come to this understanding death is humanity's common denominator. It is the thing that we're all going to experience. However, because of Jesus Christ, listen, this is, this is where it is. See, aren't you glad we don't go home right now? You see, I could just send you home right now and you could just like, wow, that was the most depressing thing I've ever heard. It would be. But there's the good news because actually there's an empty grave. There is a resurrection and Jesus has overcome. So here's the good news. You say, well, Jesus defeated death. Yes, but the promise is, the hope is, because he defeated death, he gives that to us as well. The Bible tells us that the power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that resides in the person who has accepted Christ as their Savior. And we have that power as well. So for the Christian, you know what death is? For the believer, for the one who has trusted and put their whole weight on Jesus, you know what death is? Death is just a comma. It's just a pause. It's not this period that says it's over. It's just this comma. And he said there's something more. There's something better. That is worth celebrating. Yes. Yes. Listen, the Apostle Paul, when the Apostle Paul was trying to teach a church about this, you know, the letter to the Corinthians is a Corinthian church that were just needing some guidance. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he tells them about the resurrection. And he brings them this truth in verse 21. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, you know what that is? That's Adam. Adam and Eve sinned brought death into the world. That's why we have death today, just as he did that. Now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man, that is Jesus. And just as everyone dies, because we all belong to Adam, that's our physical death, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. What a wonderful promise. Hey, there's the good news we leave on today. That's the good news we take home with us, is that Jesus has come to give us this new life. And he said, man, I have defeated death. I have the power to do that. And you can too. There's a wonderful old pastor. His name is D.L. Moody. He pastored in the Chicago area in different places. If you have ever heard of Moody Bible Church or Moody Church, he's the founder of this wonderful, wonderful church in Chicago. And he, read, he said this one day. He said, someday you will read in the paper that D.L. Moody is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? He said, at that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. That's the promise of Easter and the resurrection and what God is telling us today. Jesus alone has the power to give life. And Jesus alone has the power to defeat death. What a wonderful thing and a wonderful promise to be reminded of today. Did you know back in the 1980s, A and W Root Beer Restaurant, A and W Restaurants, tried to dethrone McDonald's Quarter Pounder by coming out with a new burger. Yeah, you can already say like, uh, I don't think that happened. You're right, it didn't happen. <laughs> but they tried. So here's what A and W did. A and W began to create a new burger. Okay, and they're going to knock off the quarter pounder. And what they did is they created a third pounder. Okay? Alright, that's good. And then they did started doing taste tests about these burgers. And most of the people they were preferring the A&W burger over the McDonald's burger. So they're like, wow, what's happened? You know, I'm getting you ready right now. You wish I, you know, all of you are going to eat lunch at McDonald's or A&W today. I know where you're going. And, and they said they, so they did all of a sudden they started doing all this marketing campaign. And what they did is, like, we've got a better tasting burger that's a bigger burger. It's a third pounder, not a quarter pounder. And it's at the same price. Now, you think, wow, this is just golden. And this is going to work. This is going crazy. And it was the biggest flop. No one bought it. They actually had to pull it from the menu. And there was this wonder. So then A&W started doing market research. It's like, why would no one want to buy our burger? It was bigger. It was better same price. It just makes sense. And as they begin to do market research, they've come to find out that the reason people rejected the hamburger was simply due to a misunderstanding of math. Oh, no. 
<laughs> the customer thought that a third pound was less than a quarter pound. Oh, my. I'd almost want to say that's what's wrong with America, but I don't know, man. My goodness, we just can't do simple fractions, right? I was just like, oh, come on. They, they looked at the three, and they said, that's a smaller number than the four. Someone failed these people a lot, big time, right? And they rejected the whole thing. You know, I, I say that it's a simple story. As some people just kind of rejected this because of misunderstanding the basics. Because this is what I want you to know today, and we're going to go home. I say, I share that story because I do not want you today to misunderstand and reject a simple truth. A simple truth that Jesus has the power to give life. He has the power to defeat death. It's a simple truth. It's a very basic, biblical teaching. And I don't want you to miss that. When Jesus comes, he came, and when he said to Martha, and what he says to me about who he is, and he says, do you believe this? Martha affirmed it. I just want you to be able to affirm it as well. Okay, yes. Yes. Now, today, I'll put it back on you for just a moment. Knowing that Jesus is asking the question, do you believe this? And knowing that he gives life and defeats death, why would you walk away not affirming that in your life today as well? Why would you walk away from such a simple truth and say, that's not for me? It is for you. I want you to know the very reason that you're here today is it's for you. The very reason that God brought you here. You're, you know, you're not here by next to death. You are here. We're all here by a divine appointment. And that God has orchestrated your life for you to be here right now. And it is for this simple truth. Yes. This is what I believe. I'm going to invite you to bow with me in prayer for just a moment. As we approach the one who gives us life and the one who has defeated death so that we can live everlasting life, I just want to know if there may be someone in the room that you walked in and you say, I'm here to support a baptism. I'm here because it's Easter. I'm here because this is the rhythm or whatever it may be. But now you're getting a sense that you're like, I'm here for so much more. That God is speaking into your life and He's talking to you about death and He's talking to you about uh, about eternity and, and all and the life He has for you. And you want to know today that we had an example this morning of ten individuals who simply humbled their heart and received the answer to their sin problem, and that is Jesus. I want to give you that privilege and that opportunity this morning. It's a simple prayer and it sounds like this. And I just want you to know, will you be willing to pray this with me? You're just praying it to the Lord. You're not praying it to me, but with me. Would you just say to the Lord in a simple prayer, Dear Jesus, I want the life you provide. I recognize I'm a sinner. You're the answer. Come into my life and save me. Forgive me and become the Lord of my life. Thank you for loving me and giving your life so I could live. Now, from this day forward, I will strive to honor, please, and live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. The basics are not complicated. You may not understand everything you read in the Bible. You may not understand everything you sing in a song in church. You may not understand the things that we do and maybe all that kind of stuff. But it comes down to this. The simplicity of this is that Jesus loves you. He's given his life for you. And if you have prayed and affirmed that in your heart and believed that, here's what I want you to understand. That there has been already a party going on in heaven on your behalf. And I would love to celebrate with you personally as well. And all I'm asking you to do, would you please come and tell me? I don't hide after these services. I go park myself right out there by the coffee service. I've got chocolate chip cookie for our guests. You need to come by and get that. And if you're one of those that said, I prayed with you, Pastor, would you just come by and let me know? I want to celebrate with you. I want to pray for you and encourage you. Do you not want that? Today, Jesus has come. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And I've come to give life. And I've come to defeat death. And we get what he gives. Praise God. I'm so thankful that you made your way here today to be a part of our services. 
If you have a question, if you would like someone to pray with you, you need some encouragement or whatever that may be, we do have encouragers to stand at the front of this church at the end of the service. They're here to pray with you. They're here to listen. They're here to answer some questions you may have. Again, I go out to the meet and greet area where I meet our guests. Please come by or anyone else that has a question. And if there's anything that we would like to set up an appointment later in the week, that Connect card in your bulletin, just let us know. I want to meet with one of the pastors, and we'll set that up and have a conversation with you about anything this week, next week. Let us know. Let's stand together as we celebrate this wonderful Easter day. I hope you have the best one ever. God bless you, church. Father, take this congregation and your people. Send them out, Father, with the love of Christ in their heart, the joy of the Lord in their countenance, Father, and the praise of God on our mouth, in our mouth. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.